Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Layton. I'm the minister at Bible Christian Church in Ark City. I hope you're having a good week. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about Kingdom Come, the theme for today, and the devotional that comes from Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to start reading there in verse 31. And it says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to, the, to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, I want us to take a moment and consider the structure of this particular passage of scripture. It's very interesting if you notice the little details that are contained in this story. Uh, first of all, the setting is the judgment of all the nations. And that, that, that It talks about the king coming in his glory, that the Son of Man will come with all his angels, and he will be set on a throne, and he will judge the nations. So the setting is the end times, and the end time judgment where Christ judges the whole world, past, present, all the history of mankind. That's what's implied when it says all the nations. It's all the people. Everyone who's ever lived or died is at this judgment. There's two things I want you to notice here that are very, very interesting in the structure. It's the king's words and then the sheep and the goat's words. First, the king, when he's talking to both groups, he speaks with the exact same structure to both. Even though he's saying very different things to both of these groups, he uses the exact same structure. Now the thing I want you to notice first is when he's giving the sentences that he gives his judgment before they have a chance to talk, that he's already settled his judgment. And he says to the sheep, he says, come, you blessed of my father, and come into this inheritance that's been prepared for you. That the thing that I want you to notice, the, the detail is when he says come, and how he addresses them, he addresses them in the opposite way when he addresses the goats. He says, depart from me, you cursed. So he says, come, you blessed, but depart from me, you cursed. What's interesting about that is not so much the destination that he's telling them to come to or the de destination that he's telling them to depart to, which is heaven versus hell, right? This is what's obviously being portrayed here. But it's what's interesting is the proximity to the king for both of these groups. For the first group, he says, come. That implies come to me or come with me, that the king will be present with them in this eternal inheritance. But to the wicked or to the goats, he says, depart away from me. He says, get away from me. And, and this is implying that he will be separate from those who are cursed 
in the lake of fire. This is the most important detail of the story. It's the, the presence of the king. That's very important that you should notice this. And when he speaks to them, he speaks to them about where they are in relationship to him. And notice the measure of judgment that he gives to them, that it's the, the hunger, the thirst, the nakedness, the sick and in prison. And he relates to them both in the same way, saying that this one group, they fed and gave a drink and clothed and visited him, and this other group did not. Now notice when he gives this, the difference in the way that the sheep and the goats speak. The sheep, when they answer him, they repeat the king almost word for word. Look there in those verses that the sheep say, where, where, when did it happen that, that, you were hungry and we fed you and thirsty and we gave you a drink. They add the details almost word for word that the king gives. But then notice the goats, when they answer, they leave out half of the details. They give a short synopsis and just say, well, where and when was it that you were hungry and, and thirsty and naked and in prison and sick? and we didn't minister to you. Notice the thing that the goats leave out is their part in it. They don't mention the details of feeding, of giving a drink, of clothing. They just lump it all into one category, minister. It tells you something about the nature of the sheep and the goats, that the sheep pay close attention to the king's words and the details of the king's words. Whereas the goats, they just kind of sum it up and they have no care for the actual details and the responsibility of what they should be doing. It's very telling. Jesus speaks this teaching and he speaks it in a way that's very precise and he's making a point even with the things that he doesn't say. Moving on, I, I want to give you another quick observation. If, if you like to study the Bible, it's an interesting thing to note that there are 48 parables of Jesus in Matthew's gospel. And they're not all necessarily parables, but at least 48 parables and, let's say, metaphors that he uses to teach spiritual truth. Now, of those 48, 43 of them contain pairs. They contain not pairs as in apples the fruit, but pairs as in twos, twins. There are groups of twos throughout 43 of the 48 parables in Matthew's gospel. Why is this important? Well, some of those uh, uh, pairs or those twins, they're, they're two different descriptions or two different ways to say the same thing. Some are, are two different objects or ideas describing uh, one spiritual concept. So he'll use two different objects or two different everyday things to describe one thing that he's trying to teach. And some are two similar things or two things that are the same thing, but they're opposite in nature and have very different destinies and outcomes. Well, why is this important? It's important because in this parable, the king separates the sheep and the goats. That's it. There's no horses. There's no pigs. There's no lions, tigers, or bears. Oh my, right? There's only two groups, the sheep and the goats. There's no third group. And what, what we do with this as a church, uh, scholars and teachers in the church and, and preachers and, and believers alike have agreed that there's really no in-between in the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus is teaching, that either you're saved or you're lost. You're either a sheep or a goat. There is no in between. You've either been born again or you haven't. That fact is important. That truth that's shown to us through this story is so important. Why? Because it should lead us to have compassion for people. Knowing that people are lost doesn't cause us to condemn them, but it should motivate us to love and serve them in the hope that God will save them. Now, we know the story is a parable that he's not giving a literal story, but it's a parable. It's a teaching tool because Jesus describes the two groups of the nations as sheep and goats, right? He says he will, as a shepherd, divide the sheep from the goats. 
you know by the context of the story that the sheep and the goats, they're, they're actually people. Uh, that Jesus isn't saying that he's going to take all the people and the, or the sheep and the goats and meh, he'll put them to the side. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about actual sheep. He's using that as a metaphor to describe the nature of the people in the story. Why is that important? Why is it important to know that this is a parable? Well, I think it's important, and I believe a lot of people would agree with me that it's important because that Jesus is teaching a deeper spiritual truth that goes beyond just the surface nature of the story. It's important because Jesus is revealing spiritual truths about those people who are saved and the people who are lost. And he's also revealing the measurement by which he's going to judge the world in truth. Everything Jesus is saying is absolutely true. And in the realist spiritual sense, it's true, but it's not a literal, physical, tangible world event that he's describing. He's describing the spiritual nature behind this actual event. Now, we know that the judgment is an actual, tangible event. And you can look in Revelation chapter 20 to find the actual event that describes a great white throne and the books of life being open and people being cast into the lake of fire and these different events happening. We know that those events are coming, but this particular parable is being told in a spiritual way to reveal something very important. So why? Why would Jesus teach us this? Why would he teach us in this way? What is the important thing that he's revealing to us about the kingdom of God? Let me tell you, Jesus uses this parable to teach us the most important aspect of the kingdom of God, which is this. It is the king. The king is the most important aspect of the kingdom of God. Remember, when he gives the sentence, he says, come. This is implying, come to me, you blessed. Come be with me. And he says to the evil, depart from me, you wicked, you cursed. The king himself, being in proximity to him, being close to him, your relationship to him is the most important thing being taught to us throughout all of the Gospels. Now, when we speak of the kingdom come, this idea of the kingdom is not the, the borders and boundaries. The borders and boundaries don't define the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God isn't just political power or a governing rule of God over a society of people. Now, those things might follow the kingdom. They might be details that are worked out within the kingdom, but those don't define what the kingdom is is the king himself is the defining attribute of the kingdom. Where the king is, his presence, and whatever belongs to him, with him, is the tangible manifestation of the kingdom of God. Listen, we're taught by Jesus himself to pray this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. Spurgeon, the great preacher once said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in me as it is in your son. This idea of the kingdom coming and, and God's will being done, they're, they're paramount. They're the, the apex, the pinnacle of what we ought to pray and what our motivation ought to be. The presence of God's kingdom and his will. While Jesus walked the earth, he brought the kingdom with him wherever he went in whatever he did. He continually did the will of his father God. He was the king present with us. And when he was walking about the earth, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachers of the law, they questioned him many times. In one particular instance, Speaking specifically of the kingdom, in Luke chapter 17, he's asked this question. It says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or, or see there, for, the, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. From the beginning to the end, the mystery and the secret that's being revealed to us is that the kingdom of God is within. You go all the way back to the beginning with Adam and Adam in the garden when he's first formed, God breathes into him the breath of life into Adam. It's not around Adam, but the breath of life is breathed 
in Adam, and Adam walks with God. And you go to Moses. Moses is out in the wilderness with the, with the Israelites, and he goes up on a mountain, and God teaches him how to build a tabernacle or a tent of meeting that's in the middle of the camp, and God's Holy Spirit is in the tent living with them, within the tent, upon the Ark of the Covenant. You flash forward to a virgin by the name of Mary. The Holy Spirit overtakes her and, and overpowers her, and she gives birth to a son and names him Jesus. And the people call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That the Spirit of God, Paul says, the Spirit of God was in Christ, in Christ, reconciling the world to himself that Christ was the manifestation of God on this earth, that the Spirit of God was upon him and within him. As he walked this earth, the King was present with us. This same truth of the kingdom being within us is shown in the church in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit, after Christ's resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside the believers. And to this day in the church, the Spirit of God lives within the believers. Christ's Spirit is within us. Paul says to the Colossian church in chapter 1, he says, it's been given to me to reveal the mystery to his saints. This is the mystery kept hidden from the beginning. From all ages, this is the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is the kingdom. His kingdom has come, and it's within the believers. Now, that's not saying that the kingdom isn't coming at the end, because it is. The nature of God is this, is that God was, God is, and God is to come. And so if the king is the main important aspect of the kingdom, then the kingdom should follow the same character because God, he is the I am, I was, and I am to come. His kingdom is within us. It was, and his kingdom is coming. It shares his nature because the king is the representation of the kingdom. Everyone, Everyone's included in this parable. There's coming a time where the, the entire world is going to be swept into the kingdom or cast out of it. This is the truth that Jesus is revealing to us. is that kingdom is here now and it's coming in a more and greater way. There's, there, the, there, the kingdom right now is him living in us, in the church, amongst believers. Jesus said where two or more are gathered. There I am. That's his kingdom. But the truth is that the kingdom is going to be manifested in an even greater way. Not just his spirit living in us in an intangible way, but there's coming a physical, tangible manifestation of his kingdom on, an, on the earth. The book of Revelation describes it. The, the holy city descending from heaven and resting upon the earth and heaven and earth meeting. The kingdom coming in completion that all will experience it. Now, in this parable, that's what he's speaking of, is the completion of his kingdom's arrival, the fullness of it. Everyone is included in this parable. Notice that everyone is separated into two groups, those who will go into the kingdom and those who will be cast out. The thing you need to notice in this story is though, though the people are spoken to in two different ways, the king himself is only described in one way, is that he was present in everyone. What do I mean by that? Notice, notice that in the parable, when he speaks to the sheep and the goats, he says, what you do to the least of these, you did it to me. And what you don't do to the least of these, you don't do it to me. That's because Christ is present everywhere. His spirit is living within believers, and I believe that his spirit is living close by to unbelievers. Those who don't know Christ, Christ is there trying to get in, trying to love them, trying to reveal himself to them. And it's us believers who have Christ living in us. It's our responsibility to love people and to serve people that they might know that Christ is with them. To tell you personally, in my own life, when I got saved and I got born again and I received the spirit of Christ in me, I came to the realization that Christ had always been with me, protecting me 
guiding me until the day when I recognized his presence with me. And I believe that's what he wants for everybody, including you, is for you to know that he is with you. And Christ shows us that we should love and be kind to everyone as though they were Jesus himself. Those who do this, those who demonstrate that God's kingdom has come and is in the present and it's coming in the future, that that, that nature of God is shown in them when they love as Christ commanded them to love. We should serve everyone as though Christ's kingdom is already here. Are you doing that? I want to challenge you. Look at everyone with the eyes that see that Christ is there, that what I do to them, I do to the Lord. We have the greatest hope in Christ. He's with us. He's with you. Remember that. Stay blessed, my friends.